You're listening to Good Mike Work Commentaries, hosted by Greg Morgan, a pro wrestling podcast for adults, discussing the fun, wild, and sometimes insane world of professional wrestling. What's going on, everybody? Good Mike Work Commentaries back at you with episode 498, up here to give you your Raw and SmackDown reviews for this week for May 7th and 8th. I'm also going to briefly review the absolutely horrendous Backlash pay-per-view that we all had to suffer through this past Sunday. We're also going to preview Money in the Bank coming up next month on the WWE Network, and we'll talk about all of the qualifying matches that we have seen so far and what direction WWE might go in heading into that pay-per-view and then beyond that into extreme. Stream Rules, and SummerSlam. So we've got a lot to get into this week. Before we do, though, I want to give you a little bit of a programming note first and let you know what you can expect from me in the next couple of weeks. As I'm sure you can hear and see, the episode count is now up to 498. We are two episodes away from episode 500, and that's creeping up. And I've kind of been racking my brain and trying to come up with some sort of a fun idea to do for the 500th episode, but I don't really have a whole lot of time to put anything special together either. So what I decided to do is do another one of those kind of two-part episodes. It's basically going to be like a two or three day long celebration of my 500th episode. That's going to come in two weeks. Next week at this time, one week from today, I will be up here as usual with episode 499 and we'll discuss next week's Raw and SmackDown shows, which are coming from the UK, I believe. So those will be taped shows. The spoilers will be out. Those of us like myself who don't give a shit about spoilers are already going to know the outcomes of Raw and SmackDown before they air. Generally, not that much takes place on these shows. We know we're going to get some qualifying matches next week, but really nothing catastrophic happens in the UK, except for the last time they were there, we actually saw AJ Styles win the WWE title. So this coming Monday night, my live Raw watch-along is in jeopardy. I might not come up here and do a live stream on Monday. I've been doing that for the past several months. It's been a lot of fun, but I actually do have a really busy weekend, and this coming Sunday is Mother's Day, which in my line of work in the restaurant business is an absolute fucking nightmare. So I really don't know what I'm going to have going on on Monday night, so I'm going to reserve the right to skip this week's live stream, which is good because you're going to get a ton of me the week after that. And plus, you've seen me so much lately. We had everything going on during WrestleMania, that whole weekend of festivities. Then we had the post-Mania Raw and SmackDowns. Then it was the Superstar Shake-Up. Then it was the Greatest Royal Rumble. Then it was Backlash. You guys are probably sick of hearing me and seeing me. So a week off probably is not going to kill you as far as live streams go. So maybe I will still be up here this Monday. I'm just not sure yet. But right now I'm leaning towards just skipping this week's live Raw Watch Along and just live tweet the show instead and maybe come up and do a live review later. But my normal routine for Monday nights is probably going to be skipped this week. The week after that, Monday Night Raw on the 21st, that is where the 500th episode festivities are going to take place. I'm going to do a two-part episode. I will be up here on Monday night, May 21st, to watch Monday Night Raw live with all of you on YouTube. So join me for the live stream, and I will stay up here several hours. After the show is over, we'll hang out, we'll discuss Monday Night Raw, and I will do a live Q&A. So send me your questions. You can put them in the chat during the night of the stream. You can send them to my email, which I would prefer because they're easier to keep track of. My email address is goodmikework at gmail.com. Send all of your questions over there. You are welcome to send them on Twitter. You're welcome to send them on Facebook. Anywhere you want. I'm just going to kind of hang out that night. And it'll basically just be a casual, chill hangout with all of us. We'll talk about Bra and SmackDown. We'll discuss you know, the next pay-per-view, we'll answer questions, I'll talk about anything you want to talk about, we'll uh, discuss the past eight years here on the Good Mike Work channel, whatever, just hang out and reflect on the fact that I have now done 500 of these fucking things, and it's crazy. A couple of days after that, on Wednesday, which I believe will be the 23rd or 24th, which I actually also think, unfortunately, is the anniversary of Owen Hart's death, uh, that will be my 500th episode as far as the podcast version of it goes. So it's going to be a two-parter. Monday will be a live stream hangout, 500th episode celebration, and then on Wednesday, early Thursday, you will get the podcast version of that episode where I will talk about the previous couple of days of TV, and I'll probably discuss some other things as well, and maybe even answer some more questions like Patreon questions and whatnot, because I will be putting up a post 
on the Patreon page for patrons only. And if you guys want to ask a question for the Q&A, I guarantee it will be answered. So that's kind of my plan there for the next couple of weeks. So just to recap, this coming Monday, May 14th, I probably will skip my live Raw Watch Along, but episode 499 will be up a couple of days later as scheduled. And then the week after that, the 21st, On Monday night, I will be doing a live raw stream. We'll talk, we'll chat, we'll answer questions, we'll hang out. That will be the 500th episode celebration, part one, and then part two will come up a couple of days later in podcast form. So there you go. I hope all of that makes sense, but that's what you can expect from me in the next couple of weeks. Let's get into what we're going to discuss tonight now, because I'll tell you, man, I'm not going to spend too much time on Backlash. I was up here to do a live review after Backlash went off the air. If you've not seen that video, it is up in the cards in the top right-hand corner of the screen there. You can check that out if you would like. During my live stream, I definitely acknowledged that the pay-per-view was crap, but I wasn't shitting on it that hard because we were basically just hanging out and chatting and, and discussing, you know, shit very casually. So I wasn't going crazy over the pay-per-view, but it was very well known that the pay-per-view was not well received by the fans, especially near the end there. It really seemed like it dragged out. The pay-per-view ran long. They went with Roman Reigns versus Samoa Joe. Fans were bored shitless. Some of them were leaving early. It was just a mess. So the pay-per-view got a resounding thumbs down from everybody. The Twitter poll that I ran, I think we had 4% of the people thought it was a good show. Everybody else thought it was a big bowl of shit, and it was. The only shining moment in the entire show was the opening match. You had The Miz and Seth Rollins battling for the Intercontinental title in a very early match of the year candidate. I mean, it was fantastic. This match had everything, and I cannot believe the work of both guys here. Super impressed with both of them. The Miz has really been on the rise. You know, his stock has risen not only in WWE, but with all of us fans as well. And if you would have told me, if you could go back in time and tell 2007 me that The Miz is one of the best in the business today, I would think you were out of your fucking mind. There is no way that 10 years ago I would have envisioned that one of the best overall performers on the mic, in the ring, character-wise, the whole package of The Miz, he is one of the best we have in the entire business. And that includes Japan, Ring of Honor, and everywhere. The Miz is that good. And I cannot believe those fucking words are coming out of my mouth. Especially the way I felt about the guy 10 years ago, 8 years ago, 7 years ago, whatever. You know, even during his first run in 2011, when they put the belt on him, he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready at all. Now, he is more than ready, and I think The Miz could easily have a run on top on SmackDown at some point. Uh, The world title situation is very crowded on SmackDown right now, but if The Miz is carrying around a briefcase, you know, that could be a great way to put the belt back on him again, and uh, I think the guy would do great. But he did come up short at Backlash. Seth Rollins did beat him clean with the curb stomp. The match, I feel like, went close to a half an hour, 20 minutes, 25 minutes at least, And it was just amazing. The near falls and the bumps and the high spots, everything was amazing. Um, You know, the way Rollins had hurt his knee on the ring post, I thought that was a great spot. Although I think the new ring posts are designed to make a loud noise when you hit them. But when Rollins smacked his knee on that ring post, I mean, it sounded like a gunshot through the whole arena. And that was an awesome spot. There was just so much going on in that match. I loved it. From bell to bell, I was entertained by it. And I was very optimistic that the rest of the pay-per-view was going to be really good because it was off to a great start. Fans were loving it. This is awesome chance. They were hot for it. And how about Seth Rollins? Can you believe this fucking guy? I mean, in the course of one month, in less than one month, he had three, count them, three successful title defenses on pay-per-view and two on Monday Night Raw. He beat uh, Finn Balor in an Intercontinental title match the week before, and then this week on Raw, he won an Open Challenge match. So that's five successful television Intercontinental title defenses that Rollins has had in the last month. That's incredible. You know, you never saw that back in the day. You know, if you add house shows in, then yeah, plenty of guys have defended the Intercontinental title five times in one month. But to do it on pay-per-view and television... All within the course of 30 days, incredible. Seth Rollins is the man. He is one of my favorite guys on the roster right now. And just like The Miz, I would like to see Seth get his opportunity on the Raw brand. I would love to see this guy get back into the world title mix at some point. But until then, he's doing an amazing job doing the Intercontinental title proud, making it the workhorse title again. Every single match that he has been in since he's been champion has been good. I think right now he is the best all-around worker, you know, on the roster aside from AJ Styles. The guy is 
incredible. So hats off to Rollins, hats off to The Miz for, you know, at least giving this pay-per-view one good moment because after that it was steeply downhill. And I mean downhill as fuck. Uh, after that, we had Nia Jax defending the title against Alexa Bliss. Nia Jax won that match. Not very surprising there. The match seemed like it drug on a little bit. Nia kept trying to hit the Samoan drop on Alexa over and over. Finally, is able to squash her and beat her, which was all fine. Nia Jax, she just won the title at WrestleMania. You're not going to take the belt off of her right away at Backlash. So I was fine with the outcome and the ending and all of that. But where it got stupid was the end, when she cut the most hideous promo I've ever heard. The only good thing about her promo is I think it was the ending line when she said bullies always get their asses kicked or whatever she should have just said that and left it alone but instead she had to deliver this very heavily scripted basically PSA for their anti-bullying campaign and she just went on and on and you could just see that it was she was literally trying to say the words as she memorized them. There was nothing from the heart. There was nothing authentic. This was purely scripted, given to her, and it's all a way to promote and basically act as an advertisement or slash commercial, whatever you want to call it, for their Be A Star campaign or whatever the fuck, which ironically, they went right into a promo for that after Nia Jax's interview. So the whole thing was just awful and extremely cringe and... uh I understand the message there, and I understand the message that they're, that they're trying to deliver, especially to the younger audience and people that might have to deal with issues like bullying or being different or anything like that. But it just comes off um, just very cheap, and I don't like it, and it, it's, it just reeks of you know WWE's uh, ulterior motives, and I just don't like it. So that whole thing sucked. Next up, we had Randy Orton facing Jeff Hardy for the United States title. Jeff Hardy won in a decent match, beat Randy Orton completely clean, which probably needed to happen. A loss at this point in Randy Orton's career isn't going to do anything to harm him. And Jeff Hardy is in the middle of a singles push. He's a champion. You know, give him a victory here. A couple of, you know, wily veterans like Hardy and Orton who have both been around a while and who can both still go. These guys are not in the ring who they used to be 10 years ago, but they've adapted to their age and how they've slowed down. And although I don't know how much Randy Orton has really slowed down. Did you see that drop kick he delivered on uh, Jeff Hardy? I mean, picture perfect drop kick. Randy Orton jumps, I don't know how many feet up in the air and just blasts Hardy right in the face. Absolutely textbook. Randy Orton, even in his late 30s here, is every bit as athletic as he seems like he's always been. And uh, the guy has always been good in the ring. And I've always had Randy Orton's back as far as his in-ring ability. I've always thought the guy was, you know, very underrated and very good in the ring. So I really had no issue with the match between the two. But still, it was a match you could have just done on SmackDown. Didn't really need to be at a pay-per-view here. But Hardy did retain and moves on. Uh, we then had an Elias segment where everybody in the world came came out. Uh, this was getting annoying, probably just because, and I'll admit this, I don't like No Way Jose. I absolutely hate the character. I hate the entrance music. I hate the whole presentation of the damn thing. So the fact that he was involved in this uh, made me not like the segment, but you needed to have some sort of a break in between all of these matches. You know, and the New Day was out there too, and there were some funny moments, and poor Elias, you know, could not get his song out, and Bobby Roode was involved, and the whole deal. So the segment wasn't, you know, it was, it was placed there to be just an entertaining breather in between these matches and I get that and I guess it served its purpose but anytime I see No Way Jose I uh, turn the other way we had Daniel Bryan versus Big Cass next, and I was surprised here. I thought Big Cass would eke out a victory here. I thought he would cheat or do something dirty. I thought maybe The Miz would get involved. I thought something would happen here where Daniel Bryan would wind up losing to Big Cass because Big Cass just emerged back from injury. He's on the SmackDown roster now. It looks like WWE wants to push him. I didn't see how he was going to lose to somebody a third his size. And if he was going to lose to him, I certainly didn't see him tapping out, which is exactly what happened. So the finish there kind of caught me off guard. I mean, Daniel Bryan is head and shoulders a better talent than Big Cass. Big Cass, in my mind, is not ready, but he is such a big monster and WWE is trying to push him that way. I did not see him tapping out in this match. I really found that surprising, but it's fine with me. I'm certainly not complaining. I'm not a very big Big Cass fan, and I'm a huge Daniel Bryan fan, so at the end of the day, I was fine with that outcome. And another outcome that kind of shocked me a little bit was the women's title match. This one I didn't like because you guys know me. I'm a big Charlotte fan. And I am really surprised. Well, let me say this. I'm not surprised Carmella won. I predicted Carmella to retain the title. But the last thing in the world that I thought would happen is that Carmella would essentially beat Charlotte clean. I mean, really, that's what happened here. 
Charlotte, what happened? What was the finish? She went for a moonsault, I think, right? Landed on her feet and kind of tweaked her knee a little bit. And that allowed Carmella to hit her, I think, with a super kick and then folded her up for the quick one, two, three. So Carmella, with no help from the Iconics, who I thought for sure were going to make an appearance in this match, they crashed the kickoff show. They were there. They were around. And we know they've had an issue with Charlotte recently. And Carmella, even though she's champion, she's one of the least credible in-ring workers on the roster. She's no Becky. She's no Sasha. She's no Charlotte no Bailey. She's not as good as any of those girls. So I thought if Carmella was going to survive, she was going to need some help to do it. But she won it on her own. And that surprised me. Charlotte tapped out Asuka at WrestleMania. Here she is losing to Carmella. What the fuck is going on (laughs) with this company? But like I said, this is not something that makes me mad. You know, if you want to push Carmella as somebody that can actually beat anybody, then fine. This was a victory that in the end of the day isn't going to harm Charlotte really at all. I'm sure Charlotte will have her day again. Um, But I was kind of surprised with that outcome there. So not sure what WWE is thinking, but whatever. What the fuck can I do about it? We then moved on to the WWE title match, which was not the main event. Two matches followed AJ and Shinsuke Nakamura. Now, I thought with no Brock Lesnar on the show, with no universal title match, how do you not put the WWE title in the main event? And judging from the finish, I guess that's why we saw that match air so early because when they started running the video package and hyping the match, I was like, holy shit, this match is next. Why in the world is this not the main event? I had even picked Shinsuke to win. So that was making me even more uneasy. I'm like, you know what? At this point, I'm actually going to be upset if Shinsuke Nakamura wins the belt because if Shinsuke Nakamura wins the WWE title, that needs to be in the main event of a wrestling show. Whether it's TV, pay-per-view, whatever, if Shinsuke's moment comes, it needs to close the show. It absolutely has to. So when those guys came out next, I was thinking, well, I think Shinsuke winning the belt might be out the window because I cannot imagine WWE putting the belt on Nakamura, but having Roman Reigns main event. Oh man, that's going to make Twitter a lot of fun. But what they did is drag out this issue even further with Shinsuke Nakamura and AJ Styles. They had a pretty good match, not as good as the Greatest Royal Rumble or WrestleMania in my mind, but it wasn't a bad match. It was also no disqualification as well. Um, both of these guys ended up hitting a couple of nut shots in each other, and then the finish saw both of them kick each other in the balls simultaneously, and they both just kind of teeter over and fall down. Neither one of them can answer the 10 count, so the referee calls for the bell. You know, we thought we were going to get a winner here with a no DQ stipulation, but instead, this issue is going to drag out even further, which on one hand, I'm fine with because they've had to do a lot in a short amount of time. We had WrestleMania, Greatest Royal Rumble, and Backlash all within the span of four weeks, less than four weeks. That's three pay-per-view matches right there that these guys have had inside of one month. And considering who these guys were and are and their history and, you know, how long fans have wanted to see these two guys clash on the main roster, normally big feuds like this, big title feuds, they stretch a few months. This thing's only been going on for like one or two months. So I can understand why they want to stretch this out one more pay-per-view. But the problem now is WWE's silly ass scheduling of their pay-per-views, you know, after what we've seen between these two guys, AJ and Shinsuke and all the bad blood and all the dirtiness and all of the nut shots, these two guys to me should be on a collision course for some sort of an extreme rules match or a hell in the cell match but unfortunately you can't do either because the next pay-per-view is money in the bank i don't know what they do here do they do one more match between shinsuke and aj at money in the bank and then maybe shinsuke wins the title and then aj gets the rematch in some big stipulation match at extreme rules where Shinsuke retains and then goes on to SummerSlam. I mean, I guess that's what we're going to have to see here. Otherwise, this means Shinsuke Nakamura has failed to win the WWE title in about a half a dozen title matches now. So if you don't put the belt on him, I think you're kind of killing the guy. So I'm surprised we didn't get a finish here. I thought they could have just put the belt on Shinsuke at Backlash, had the rematch next month and call it a day, but they are stretching it out. And I guess it is possible that maybe AJ Styles takes that title into SummerSlam. He's had a hell of a run. And if that's what they did, as big of a fan of of Shinsuke Nakamura as I am, if they want to keep the belt on AJ Styles, I am perfectly fine with that. With these two guys, as well as they work together, really at the end of the day, whoever comes out on top of this feud, I'm really not going to care. But it does look like we're going to get another match at Money in the Bank. We haven't gotten any sort of official announcement on that yet, but I'm assuming that's going to be coming next week during the overseas SmackDown show. Next up, we had the tag team match between Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley versus Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Not much going on here either. Str- 
Strowman and Lashley did pick up the win. They are teasing the split with Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens. There might even be a babyface turn in Kevin Owens' future. I can kind of smell that. Sami Zayn wants to leave the match. He wants to walk away, give it up, throw in the towel. Uh, Kevin Owens doesn't want him to. They're arguing on the outside of the ring. Eventually, this leaves Owens all by himself in the ring to get power slammed and pinned uh, by Braun Strowman, I believe. Or no, I'm sorry. I think Lashley hit him with the vertical. I think that was the finish. Excuse me. Um, But Strowman and Lashley got the victory there. Nothing really to say about that match. I think the story was really more between uh, Owens and Zayn, and that would be furthered on Monday Night Raw as well. And then in the main event, we had Roman Reigns taking on Samoa Joe. Roman Reigns predictably did get the victory here. I'm sure a lot of fans absolutely hated that, thought it was the wrong decision, but Roman Reigns has lost a lot recently, especially to Brock Lesnar, and he has not had a great year. So giving Roman Reigns a victory over a big opponent like this on pay-per-view, of course, that's what WWE is going to do. The match started off good. Joe attacked Roman before the bell even rang and ended up hitting Roman Reigns with a urinagi through the announce table. And then they would go on to have a pretty hard-hitting, brutal match. But again, the pay-per-view ran long. These two guys don't wrestle the same type of style that an AJ Styles or a Finn Balor wrestle. So you had a lot of rest holds. You had a lot of quiet spots in the match. The fans were absolutely bored shitless, chanting, this is boring, and beat the traffic. And a lot of them were leaving because why stay? You know, why stay to see Roman Reigns beat this guy? You know, get a head start. And it was just really kind of a poor, you know, match placement here, I think. I think WWE just wanted to get Backlash out of the way. We saw no title changes here. And, you know, Backlash, do I dare say it? Do I dare say the phrase that it was a glorified house show? Because that's pretty much what it fucking was. Or it was at least a glorified Raw and SmackDown. Every single one of these matches that we saw on this pay-per-view could have easily taken place on Raw and SmackDown. And I think this was a case of WWE just wanting to get backlash over with and not really putting a whole lot of thought into it. Their eyes were on Money in the Bank and Extreme Rules and SummerSlam, and they weren't really thinking a whole lot about backlash because backlash came only nine days after the Greatest Royal Rumble. So we've just had a lot of wrestling here, and the fact that we got a shitty pay-per-view doesn't really surprise me at the end of the day. But the pay-per-view was bad, one of the worst we've seen in a while, and one of the... Uh, worst as far as uh, fan reaction on social media. Everybody was shitting on the show. A lot of times I think the fans take things too far. Sometimes I think they freak out and fly off the rails when it's not warranted. And I think they just like to be angry a lot of times. They're just insistent on being angry and they're determined to be pissed off about something. But in this case with Backlash, this pay-per-view really was a big steaming pile of shit. Let's move on now to Monday Night Raw. This week's Raw was not as bad as the previous week's Raw. I think last week was not really a good show. Overwhelming negative reviews from the fans last week. This Raw was not quite as bad, but it wasn't really a great show either. I think SmackDown was a little bit better this week. But Monday Night Raw did see a lot of Money in the Bank qualifying matches, and we are getting the ball rolling now, heading into that pay-per-view. And now we can start speculating who's going to win the briefcase because we have a couple of combatants announced. And Raw opened up with a qualifying match. Kevin Owens versus Braun Strowman. This was set up in a promo by Kurt Angle where Braun Strowman and Kevin Owens end up coming out to the ring. Kevin Owens sticks his nose in their business. And then Kurt Angle says, fine, if you want a chance at the money in the bank and you want a chance at the title, then you're going to have to face Braun Strowman right now. And the winner will qualify for the money in the bank. And of course, no big surprise here. Braun winds up completely annihilating Kevin Owens, even hitting him with those running shoulder tackles. He did it at Backlash 2. That's a really fun spot. Kevin Owens does not or has not learned to get out of the way of those things. This is like three weeks in a row now. He's been completely run down on the outside of the ring by Braun Strowman in absolutely hilarious moments. I love it when Braun does that. But he gets in the ring, beats the absolute piss out of Kevin Owens, power slams him, pins him, and qualifies for the money in the bank. So Braun Strowman, this big motherfucker, is going to be in the money in the bank match. I didn't think that they were going to do that with guys like this. I did not think we were going to see... People like Braun Strowman in the Money in the Bank. Why the hell does he even need to be there? Just give this guy a title shot. Roman Reigns doesn't need to be in the Money in the Bank either. So I thought certain talent like that weren't going to be involved in the Money in the Bank ladder match. But this actually might make it fun. I'm such a big Braun Strowman fan. You know what? I'm willing to give this a shot. 
He's such a big, crazy bastard. I'm waiting for him to put one of these ladders between two slices of bread and eat the fucking thing. So who knows what we're going to see from him at Money in the Bank, but it should be entertaining as hell. So Braun Strowman is the first one to qualify. And if his big ass does climb up there and retrieve that briefcase, he would make a pretty entertaining Money in the Bank briefcase holder. That's for sure. But a guy like Braun Strowman and his character, he doesn't need the briefcase. I think the briefcases are the most fun when they're in the hands of a heel that can capitalize on a situation and steal the title. I always just think that's better, adds more heat. When a babyface holds it, it doesn't feel quite the same, Um, but it would be funny seeing Braun Strowman walk around with all this hardware, but no championship. He's got the Royal Rumble trophy. He's got that green ass fucking vegetable belt. Now he's got a big green, ugly briefcase, which they did change. I think the logo on the briefcase a little bit. I mean, the logo itself looks the same. It just looks bigger and even more obnoxious than normal. Uh, Next up on Raw, we had a women's qualifying match. It was a triple threat. Ember Moon taking on Sasha Banks and Ruby Riot. And this was a pretty good match and a fun match and a great finish. Ember Moon hits an awesome eclipse. I believe Sasha is going for the bank statement on Ruby Riot in the ring. Ember climbs up to the top rope and nails her stunner finisher on Ruby right when Sasha has got her set up for the finisher and gets the pin and advances and qualifies for the money in the bank. So now we have Ember Moon in this match, which is a good idea. And I think, uh, Amber Moon is a good candidate to maybe win that briefcase. But I think Ruby Riot or Sasha Banks, maybe not Sasha. She might be doing something with Bailey, but I think Ruby Riot will eventually find her way into the Money in the Bank match as well. I like Ruby, and I think she should be in there. And I think Ruby Riot would be another fun candidate to hold the briefcase. I think she would make it entertaining. Uh, Next up on Monday Night Raw, at least according to my notes, was the very uncomfortable, strange, odd, cringy interview with Bobby Lashley and Renee Young. Now, I liked what they did here initially. They showed a big video package about Bobby Lashley, about his life, about his background, something that I've been telling them to do ever since he got there because I've said all along that there's going to be some fans that might not know who the hell Bobby Lashley even is. And if they do remember him, they might not remember him very well. He hasn't been in the company in 10 years. He was never really that big of a name to begin with, but they're bringing him back as if he is this Brock Lesnar level of character, but nobody gives a shit. He gets no reaction whatsoever from the audience. He's got the charisma of a box of laundry detergent. The guy just doesn't connect at all with the audience, despite how good he is and his amazing look. I mean, this guy looks like a badass, and I loved the way they chronicled his life and showed all of the, you know, the the championships he won, you know, wrestling on an amateur level, you know, and being in the armed forces and all that stuff. The guy really does have a very good story. And he's a very hardworking, driven, motivated human being, and he is very likable. The problem is the fans just don't care. And then after they show the video package, they go to a sit-down interview with Renee Young, where all he does is talk about his three or four sisters, tells a story about all of them, and then says that he loves them, and that's it. And that that was it. I I was just sitting there, I was doing the live stream on Monday, and I'm just looking at the camera like, what am I watching? You know, if WWE is trying to make this guy likable, that's not really, that shouldn't be that hard to do. I mean, all you have to do, a video package will tell that story. So the whole thing was just odd. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. And it did a horrible job, I think, of making Bobby Lashley likable to the fans. Not because he's not saying anything that's not relatable. I'm sure everybody can relate to some of what Lashley says, but there's just something missing there. The video package was great. There was really nothing wrong with that video package. But when he sat down and talked to Renee Young about absolutely nothing, to me, that all killed it. So WWE needs to rethink this. If they can't figure out a way to really get the fans to care about him in the role of a babyface, then you got to make this motherfucker a heel. And that's another problem with Bobby Lashley is if you try to envision him as an angry, vicious heel, you can't even picture it, can you? Because he's got that nice, innocent, sweet face. He's not like Braun Strowman. He can't do a big growl. He can't yell. You know, his best bet maybe would be to try. We've never seen him with any. I don't even know if he knows how to grow a beard. But maybe the guy should grow a big beard. Make himself look like Kimbo Slice. Wear a fucking do-rag. Get some tattoos. I don't know. You know, just do something just to make him look a little scarier because he just doesn't, despite his physical ridiculousness, how big this guy is and how strong he is, freakishly strong he is, he doesn't strike fear when I look at him. You know, he doesn't strike fear in me the way Braun Strowman does. I mean, even on the other side of the TV screen in the comfort of my own home, this guy has got me shit in my pants sometimes in fear. Don't get that feeling from Bobby Lashley at all. So 
I don't know what they can do here. I don't know what, what advice I can even give to WWE. I'm sure they're trying their best. But right now, doesn't feel like it's working with Bobby Lashley. And I'm hoping things turn the corner. Because Lashley, like I said, he is a likable guy. There's no reason. There's no good reason to root against this guy. On paper, this guy has what it takes to be a big star, but he's not translating on television, and that's really the only way I can think of to describe it. So I hope that makes sense <laughs> to any of you guys. And if you have any suggestions of what you think WWE should do with Bobby Lashley to help him get over a little bit more and help the fans actually give a shit about the guy, please let me know in the comments below because I would love to hear some ideas and tweet your ideas to WWE. I think they could use some as well. Uh, next up on Raw, we had another match between Jinder Mahal and Chad Gable. Now, last week, Chad Gable beat Jinder Mahal completely clean in a one-on-one -on -one match. Jinder Mahal is bothering Kurt Angle all night long. He wants to be in the money in the bank. But right now, Kurt Angle is not even putting him in a qualifying match. So basically, this match against Chad Gable is just to try to convince Kurt Angle to put Jinder Mahal in a qualifying match. So basically, this is a qualifying match to qualify for a qualifying match. It's confusing as fuck. But Jinder Mahal does avenge the loss from last week, beats Chad Gable... And uh, now I guess Kurt Angle might put him in a qualifying match next week on Monday Night Raw. And that would not be the last we would see of Jinder Mahal in this show either. Uh, next up, we had a tag team match between Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler taking on Rhino and Slater. So we had a little miniature 3MB reunion here. Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler beat the absolute shit out of these two guys and hit their really cool tandem finisher that I like. I believe they hit that on Slater very viciously when Rhino was knocked off the ring apron and they got the very easy win there. Like I said, I'm a big fan of Drew McIntyre. I mentioned that last week. When I look at the guy physically, when I look at what he has, his physical gifts, his size, his look, his ring ability, and his mic skills. I don't know. I said this last week. I don't know what WWE sees in Roman Reigns that they don't see in Drew McIntyre. I mean, he's got it all. And, and, and people could argue that he has it better than Roman Reigns. So to me, this guy is the next big thing. And I hope he is pushed to the moon by WWE. The alliance with Dolph Ziggler is a little bit annoying. One thing I don't like is when Drew McIntyre comes out there to his music and then the music stops and Dolph Ziggler's pink sparkly music starts and Drew McIntyre has got to walk down to the ring to this nonsense. I think Ziggler should come out first and then Drew should follow Ziggler instead of the other way around. It would fit better. But to see this badass, ass-kicking monster, Drew McIntyre, coming down to the ring with pink stars all over the Titan Tron, I don't like it, doesn't fit, and I don't think it's good for Drew at all. But that's really my own, only complaint about this alliance so far. Um, I, I say take it slow with Drew McIntyre. He doesn't have to be world champion tomorrow, but he definitely does need to be in that mix at some point in the future. So uh, whatever they're doing here with Ziggler, if they're using Ziggler as a stepping stone for Drew McIntyre and it's, and it's going to lead to a breakup and Ziggler's going to put him over, whatever the hell happens there, I don't know. Just please, WWE, don't fuck up this Drew McIntyre situation. You have got a gem on your hands here, and please don't ruin it. Make this guy a star because I think he's got all the tools. Uh, we had a one-on-one -on -one match next with uh, Bobby Roode taking on Elias. Now, Bobby Roode and Elias fought last week. Roode got countered out when he took a really nasty throat bump on the turnbuckle or whatever, and uh, referee had to stop the match. This week, it's a one-on-one -on -one match with Elias again, and he beats him. Bobby Roode beats Elias completely clean, hits the glorious DDT, pins him one, two, three, whatever there. Uh, Bobby Roode... I think he's losing steam. I think he's starting to lose uh, the respect of the audience. I, well, I don't want to say respect because Bobby Roode's a great talent. Don't get me wrong. But I view him more as like a mid-card, semi-main event guy at the most. You know, U.S. title, shit like that. Where Elias, I just see as a huge star. The guy is involved in segment after segment every week on TV. He gets a great crowd reaction. He's over his shit. Fans like him. His overall character presentation, ability, how comfortable he is on the mic, how talented he is with the guitar and his charisma and everything. He has some charisma. He has the charisma that I wish Bobby Lashley had. I wish you could tear a chunk of charisma off of Elias and, and give it to Lashley, you know, just to help him out. But, you know, as far as the outcome here, a lot of people were upset that Bobby Roode beat Elias. Me, I really don't care. For me, I, I don't give a shit. It doesn't matter to me either way. I think Elias still has a ton of potential. And in the long run and in the long term, I don't know if this, if this loss to Bobby Roode is really going to harm Elias all that much, especially if a briefcase is in his future. 
Next up on Monday Night Raw was the Intercontinental Title Open Challenge match that I referenced earlier on. Seth Rollins comes down to the ring on Raw and offers an open invitation to anybody in the locker room that wants to come down to the ring and challenge him for the belt. Mojo Rawley answers that challenge, which was kind of random, but whatever. Mojo gets in the ring and gives Seth a pretty decent little match. Seth winds up beating Mojo with the blackout in what was his fifth successful title defense on television or pay-per-view inside of one month, which to me, like I said earlier, is just an incredible stat. I mean, how many times did Brock Lesnar defend the Universal title in the last year? Compare that to how many times Seth Rollins has defended the Intercontinental title just in the last month, and I bet you it's pretty close. So Seth is my guy right now. I cannot say enough good things about him, but don't worry, I'm not going to go too crazy professing my love to Seth Rollins because I already sucked his dick earlier on in this episode, so I'm not going to keep that going, but you guys know that Seth is my guy right now. I am so fucking impressed, and I love that Intercontinental title around his waist. And then finally, in the main event, we had a Money in the Bank qualifying match, which was a triple threat match between Sami Zayn, Finn Balor, and Roman Reigns. Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens still have their issues. They were backstage after Owens got beat by Strowman, and Zayn was asking Owens to have his back. And Owens said, yes, sure, I've got your back. He never really appeared in this triple threat match, so I think next week on Raw, things are going to get closer to boiling over between Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, and I'm guessing it might lead to some sort of a match and maybe even a blow-off at Extreme Rules. Wouldn't be surprised at all if these guys finally have one big final battle at Extreme Rules, what, maybe two years after their last final battle took place, which I also think was a July pay-per-view, if I'm not mistaken, so it looks like they're, you know, leading down that road with those guys at some point, Uh, but this was a nice match because Roman Reigns didn't win. Right when you think Roman Reigns is going to get the victory here, out of nowhere, Jinder Mahal appears at ringside. Roman, I believe, is set up for the spear, and Jinder grabs Roman Reigns' leg, allowing Finn Balor, I think, to hit... Uh, the coup de grace on Sami Zayn and get the win. So Roman was screwed over by Jinder Mahal, which to me is just kind of odd. What are they going to do? Put Jinder Mahal and Roman Reigns in a program now? That's going to be crazy. What I'm thinking is going to happen is that since Jinder interfered, Kurt Angle is going to make Jinder Mahal face Roman Reigns in a qualifying match for Money in the Bank, which I don't see Jinder Mahal winning that. So why, what the motivation for Jinder was to even come out there and interfere in that match, I have no idea. So I don't know where that's leading or what they're going to do there. Uh, My only guess, like I said, is it will lead to a qualifying match between Jinder and Roman, and Roman may still wind up qualifying for the Money in the Bank. And we've all been talking a lot about Roman Reigns. He's been a big topic of conversation lately, considering all the matches he's lost to Brock Lesnar and how WWE still is trying to get this guy over as a baby face. It's almost as if they don't understand that nobody gives a shit. Now they might be putting him in the ring with another guy that all of the fans hate, hoping that between the two, Roman will get the majority of the cheers. I have no idea what's going on in WWE's head. Bottom line here is fans just don't give a shit about Roman Reigns. That's just the facts of it. And so if WWE wants to continue to try all these little things to get him over... Well, I guess they can, but it seems like a big waste of time to me because nothing is working. So uh, I guess we'll find out next week what Roman Reigns and Jinder Mahal will be doing at the Money in the Bank pay-per-view, whether they're wrestling each other or whether one of them makes it into the ladder match. And maybe they do a match next week with Roman and Jinder, and Jinder does find a way to win. He cheats to win. He gets some interference on his behalf somehow and uh, winds up beating Roman Reigns and qualifying for the Money in the Bank. I don't know, but if I had to guess right now, judging from the finish of the main event, I think Kurt Angle will probably make Jinder face Roman Reigns in a match next week. Uh, Whether or not that's uh, for a spot in the Money in the Bank match, uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see there. So that's pretty much your Raw in a nutshell. Like I said, not as bad of a show as it was the week before, but nothing really that great either. Just a lot of qualifying matches and a lot of, you know, they're they're setting the groundwork for the Money in the Bank pay-per-view. The same thing took place on SmackDown Live. Now, SmackDown was a pretty quick show. Wasn't a whole lot going on. A couple of qualifying matches, and one of them opened the show. It was The Miz taking on Jeff Hardy. In a singles match, the winner qualifies for the Money in the Bank. This one was pretty predictable to me, considering that Jeff Hardy successfully retained at Backlash and defeated Randy Orton clean, and The Miz lost to Seth Rollins clean. Hardy has a belt. Miz does not. Miz was the guy that needed to win here. I was happy with the outcome of the match, and I'm glad that The Miz is in the Money in the Bank because he's a guy on the men's side of things that's on my short list. He's probably right up there with the number one guy that I would like to see win the briefcase because you know The Miz can make it entertaining. That's been my argument all along that the briefcase needs to be in the hands of a dirty heel because they make it so fun and entertaining. So I think The Miz would be a great candidate to win that briefcase. And right now I'm kind of hoping that he does. 
Uh, we then had a women's qualifying match with Charlotte taking on Peyton Royce. Now, Charlotte, not surprisingly here, she did tap out Peyton Royce with the figure eight rather easily here. That's the outcome that should have happened. But again, much like Strowman and much like Roman, I'm surprised they're even putting Charlotte in this Money in the Bank match. I thought she would be in line for another title shot. She doesn't need the briefcase. Charlotte is who she is. You know, she's the most decorated female wrestler in WWE history already in her short career. She doesn't really need a briefcase to win the belt. But considering that she technically lost clean at Backlash to Carmella, maybe she's had to, maybe she's been uh, pushed down the ladder a little bit and this is her way to get back in it. But, you know, I thought Peyton Royce, you know, would obviously be a, a contender uh, to win the briefcase or one of them, but uh, she tapped out in a pretty quick match to Charlotte there. Don't know if the Iconics are going to get another opportunity. Maybe Billy Kay gets a qualifying match next week. Maybe she wins, maybe she loses, we don't know. But right now we've got Charlotte in there and it looks like WWE is trying to stack both the men's and the women's Money in the Bank matches with as much top talent as they can. That's the way it looks like right now. And as far as Charlotte goes and her status at Money in the Bank and her spot in that ladder match, it could very well be in jeopardy because there have been some reports circulating the past couple of days that she has popped one of her breast implants. Not really sure where this injury took place, if it took place at Backlash or on Tuesday night against Peyton Royce, but apparently she's going to have to get this thing operated on. Now, from what I've read, it looks like she's working the UK tour right now. So maybe this is something that you can hold off. I don't know how urgent something like this is. If you pop a tit, if you have to get it operated on right away, or if you can hold it off, it looks like they're holding it off for Charlotte, and she'll probably get that done when she comes back here to the States. And again, recovery time on that, I'm really not sure. I mean, for actual breast implants, that takes a while. But for a repair job like this, I don't know. Money in the Bank is still over a month away. So it's possible that Charlotte could still be good to go for the Money in the Bank ladder match. If not, I guess they will just uh, remove her and have another qualifying match to find a replacement, uh, if I had to guess. But best of luck to Charlotte uh, dealing with that uh, very strange injury. And I hope she uh, does not have to be kept on the shelf for very long and she gets back in action ASAP. Uh, next on SmackDown, we had a one-on-one -on -one match between Cesaro and Xavier Woods. Xavier Woods took on Sheamus last week and beat him. This week, Cesaro takes on Xavier one-on-one -on -one and does avenge the loss of Sheamus last week and beats Xavier Woods. And it was announced in a really interesting kind of stipulation here. Next week on SmackDown, we're going to get a tag team match between the New Day and The Bar. And it's going to be a Money in the Bank qualifying match, which I believe means the winner, whichever tag team wins, gets to send one guy into the Money in the Bank match. So basically, it's up to them. They get to choose. And how long, how many weeks now have I been begging WWE to do something with Big E? I have absolutely loved this guy. He is so fucking entertaining. It drives me crazy. I think he's got potential out the ass. He's really kind of come into his own in the new day, and he does such a good job of being a really funny, goofy, hysterical type of character, a guy that will just make you die in laughter when he's eating pancakes and rubbing baby oil all over himself. But at the same time, when he wants to get mad and angry, he scares you shitless. So I, I don't know what they're going to do here, if they're ever going to disband the New Day, if they're ever going to go their separate ways, but this might be the beginning of it. If New Day wins next week, I don't know how they decide who gets in the Money in the Bank match, but I'm hoping Big E will be the man selected. You would think it might be Kofi or Xavier because they're quick and they can run up the ladder quicker, but put Big E in there. That would be my vote. I think the guy's amazing, and I think he being in possession of the Money in the Bank briefcase would be very entertaining. Could you imagine Big E coming out there carrying his briefcase with the New Day and eating pancakes and wearing a helmet, you know, and all of the different teases and cash-ins he could do? As far as a babyface holding the briefcase, he would probably be one of the more entertaining picks as far as a babyface goes uh, to be the briefcase holder because otherwise you know if it's like roman reigns or something you know what's going to happen i'm going to hold the briefcase and cash it in and i'm not going to do anything dirty or anything like that it, it's just going to be too baby face -ish. it's like when cena had the briefcase it was stupid so if you are going to put the briefcase with a baby face you got to you got to make it somebody fun and you have to do it with somebody fun so i don't necessarily know if this is going to be the beginning of biggie's push or not or the beginning of something more for him but judging from the match that they've announced next week it's in the back of my mind that maybe this could 
could be it for Big E. I'm keeping my fingers crossed because I am a big fan of his. Uh, we had another women's qualifying matchup next. Mandy Rose defeated Becky Lynch uh, to qualify. Now, Paige had banned Sonya Deville backstage in a really cringy segment. God, the acting is so fucking terrible. Uh, Mandy Rose is back there with Sonya Deville, and they're talking about something. And Paige approaches them and informs Sonya Deville that she's banned from ringside. And it was so stupid. Paige said something like, I'm sorry, Sonya, but you are banned. And then Sonya's like, what, what, what do you mean I'm banned? And I'm watching this like, what do you mean? What do you mean I'm banned? How, how much clearer can you be? It was just really poor acting. These women, a lot of these stars, men and women in the WWE, I know they already have some acting classes, but they need to get some better people teaching these classes or something because they fucking suck. Uh, so that whole backstage thing was dumb. Uh, but then they go to the match and Mandy Rose actually picks up an upset victory over Becky Lynch and she qualifies. And I like Mandy Rose as well. She is extremely easy on the eyes, even though my girl right now is Peyton Royce. Um, I'm a Mandy Rose fan, and I'm hoping that Becky Lynch can still find her way in here. And that's the thing. With a lot of these matches, we still have a full month until Money in the Bank. You know we're going to get some second chance matches and, and all that kind of shit. Somebody that's lost a qualifying match previously, I think will probably wind up qualifying in the end. There's probably a couple of talents like that. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Becky Lynch, uh, Ruby Riot. Maybe even a Sami Zayn or Kevin Owens, maybe even a Roman Reigns. I wouldn't be surprised to see any of those guys find their way into the respective Money in the Bank matches. So if anybody's freaking out that their guy or their girl isn't in the Money in the Bank match yet, just calm down. They might still get in there. Don't freak out. And in another surprising outcome, the main event of SmackDown was incredibly surprising. It was like a weekend of surprising outcomes. I did not see Daniel Bryan tapping out Big Cass at Backlash. I did not see Carmella defeating Charlotte Clean. I did not see Mandy Rose defeating Becky. And I certainly didn't see Rusev defeating Daniel Bryan. Clean. I mean, there was no bullshit going on in this match. It was crazy. Uh, It was a good match between Daniel Bryan and Rusev. Daniel Bryan, you thought, would easily, you know, dispose of Rusev and qualify for the Money in the Bank. But I guess they're going with the story that Cass really softened up Daniel Bryan. Because don't forget, after their match at Backlash, Cass attacked Daniel Bryan to kind of keep his heat going and beat the shit out of him after the match. So I guess technically Daniel Bryan wasn't 100%. But he got in the ring with Rusev, and Rusev ended up hitting him with the Machka kick and pinned him and qualified for the Money in the Bank in a finish that I really liked. I was actually perfectly fine with that. I love Rusev. And I don't know if this is just a red herring, if WWE really has no intention of doing anything with Rusev. He's so fucking over. We hear Rusev chants on Raw, SmackDown, pay-per-views everywhere. The guy sells a ton of merchandise. They're even teasing, putting him back together with Lana, which I think is eventually going to happen. I think Rusev is going to dump Aiden English, even though I love the two of them together. I think they're pushing and they're kind of uh, moving towards a reunion between Rusev and Lana on television anyway. And Lana is just looking amazing in some of her backstage segments with the two of them when she wears that Rusev shirt, that low-cut Rusev shirt. Oh, my God. And her accent has mysteriously gone away, which I poked fun at last week. And as stupid as I find all of that, I'm never going to complain about staring at Lana. It is pretty awesome. So maybe what winds up happening is Aiden English tries to get involved in Money in the Bank and ends up screwing over Rusev somehow. Maybe Rusev has got his hands on the briefcase and Aiden English does something to fuck it up. And then the next week on TV, Rusev blames him, beats the shit out of Aiden English, and uh, reforms his alliance with Lana, and they become a pair again on television. That's kind of where I see that going. Otherwise, if you want to put the briefcase with Rusev, I'm perfectly fine with that, too. He would be a hugely entertaining briefcase holder. The guy's awesome. So, you know, between, you know, Rusev and Big E and even a Braun Strowman, there are some entertaining and interesting possibilities here for the Money in the Bank. And uh, I guess we still have like four more guys to qualify for this thing. So right now on the men's side of things in the Money in the Bank, we have Braun Strowman, Finn Balor, The Miz and Rusev. Of those four guys, as much as I love Braun Strowman, um, I would rather see Miz or Rusev win the briefcase as far as those four guys go. If they add Big E, if they wind up adding Jinder or Roman or maybe even Daniel Bryan at some point in the future, maybe even a Samoa Joe. We didn't see Samoa Joe on SmackDown, so maybe he comes back next week and wins a qualifying match. That's very possible. So it's going to be a beefy Money in the Bank match. We're going to have some big guys in there. We're going to have some smaller guys in there. It's going to be a wide array of all sorts of shapes and sizes of wrestlers in this briefcase match. 
and it should be pretty fun. So I guess we'll wait and see what happens next week and when we get the remainder of the qualifiers. I'm guessing that they're going to stretch this out at least a couple of weeks. I don't think that we're going to get everybody next week on the men's and women's side of things. We'll probably get a couple of more qualifying matches next week, and then the, they'll be finalized the week after that around the time that I do my 500th episode, actually. So it should be a lot of fun. Let me know who you think is going to win the Money in the Bank briefcase on the men's side of things and the women's side of things. And on the women, we only have three, I believe, that have qualified so far ember moon charlotte and mandy rose so i don't know who all of your early picks are to win the briefcase one of my early picks was ruby riot but right now she's not qualified she had lost her qualifying match so unless she gets a second chance opportunity or something like that uh she might not even make it in but she would be one of my early picks as far as women that i would like to see win the briefcase ruby riot would be on the top of my list uh, we also saw no AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura on SmackDown. Well, we saw Shinsuke. He did an interview uh, with Renee Young backstage. Nothing was revealed as far as what they're going to do next between these two. I'm guessing that will come next week. And uh, they'll probably announce a rematch for Money in the Bank. One more opportunity for Shinsuke. And maybe, like I said earlier, Shinsuke wins the title at Money in the Bank. And then AJ gets the rematch at Extreme Rules in a really big stipulation match. And uh, Shinsuke retains. And that's it. And he moves on to SummerSlam. But at what point is AJ Styles going to wear a fucking cup? What is this guy thinking? Put some protection on your twig and berries when you got this asshole from Japan kicking the shit out of them every single time you guys are in the ring together. At this point, AJ Styles is just starting to look stupid. So wear some fucking protection. And I mentioned in my last episode, it would be funny if they did a play on the Goldberg Bret Hart steel plate from WCW when Bret Hart wore the plate. Goldberg speared him and knocked himself out. It would be really funny if, if AJ wore a steel cup and, and Nakamura goes goes for the nut shot and winds up injuring his arm or leg or something, you know, maybe he goes for the kick. Maybe he kicks the cup, damages his leg, and AJ then immediately locks him into the calf crusher and makes Shinsuke tap out. So they should do some sort of a finish like that at this point. But as much as we have seen the nut shots during this feud, you know that's got to play in to the blow off somehow. So uh, it looks like they might stretch this out to more pay-per-views, especially if Shinsuke wins the belt. Because if he does, then you know AJ is entitled to a rematch. And we're going to be looking here at uh, five or six matches between these two when this program finally wraps up up. So that pretty much wraps up your reviews this week for Backlash, Monday Night Raw, and SmackDown. Before I get out of here, though, I do want to mention one other thing as well, and that is Chris Jericho made a surprise return to New Japan Pro Wrestling. A lot of you guys have been asking me to comment on this. I loved this. This was a very pleasant surprise for me. I was really happy about this because I was under the assumption that Chris Jericho was done with New Japan. He worked the match with uh, Kenny Omega at the beginning of the year. He attacked Naito like the next day, and it looked like they were going to build to a match between those two, and then... Out of nowhere, the whole thing just falls through and Chris Jericho is done with New Japan. He even said so in several interviews that uh, he wasn't going to be going back there and it sounded like it was kind of a money issue or something. So for him to make a surprise return here, I thought was great and I was very pleasantly surprised to hear about this news and they do have a show coming up next month, uh, the Big Dominion show, and I guess that's where they're going to book the Jericho and Naito match, which is great. I'll be watching that. Should be a lot of fun. And uh, Jericho going back over there might explain now why he might have been bumped from the match with The Undertaker. We still don't know what was going on at the Greatest Royal Rumble with Rusev getting the match, then being replaced by Jericho, then Jericho being replaced by Rusev. Maybe this New Japan deal had something to do with it. Maybe Chris Jericho informed WWE that he was going to go back there for one more stint, and then they decided to pull him from the match with The Undertaker. I don't know the story there. I don't even know if that's true, but it might explain why WWE was uh, going around in circles with that fucking casket match at the Greatest Royal Rumble. But as far as Jericho going back to New Japan, I think it's awesome. Uh, I loved it when he was there the first time, and I hope his match in June with Naito is just as good as his match with Omega was back in January. So I will be looking forward to watching that show, and I'm sure I will get up some sort of a review on it as well. So that is pretty much it for me for this week. I've got to get out of here and go to work, and then I'm going to come home tonight and edit this whole damn thing and get it up to you. And don't forget, like I said, keep a lookout on the channel in the next couple of weeks. We've got a lot going on this coming Monday night on Raw. I probably will be skipping my 
live Raw watch along. Although, check on the channel and check on Twitter also, because if I do decide to do one, I will. If, I, if I'm able to do one, I still will come up here, but right now I'm not planning on it. And then in two weeks, we've got the big 500th episode celebration. Should be a lot of fun. Send me all of your questions if you want to chat wrestling and uh, you know you want to submit a question for the live Q&A or the podcast version of the Q&A. Send them over to goodmikework at gmail.com or you can tweet them to me or Facebook them to me or if you're a supporter on Patreon, you can ask your questions there. So you guys have a great rest of your week and weekend and I will talk to you in just a few days. Until next time. Peace. This has been a Good Mike Work Commentaries production. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash goodmikework. Follow Greg Morgan on Twitter at goodmikework. And visit goodmikeworkcommentaries.com for all the latest podcast and video content.